Hello, everyone, and welcome to October's Abortion Healing Provider Webinar. I love seeing all your faces every month. It's just keep growing and growing. We're so grateful you're here. My name is Lisa Rowe, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the CEO of Support After Abortion. And I come to you wearing many different hats throughout my journey on this webinar. And today I really feel like I get to come to you as a peer and as somebody who has really encountered the topic we're going to talk about today. So I'm really excited. Uh, last, last month, you might have seen me as this jerk of a facilitator. <laughs> if you were here, if you weren't, uh, it is recorded and waiting for you to watch. But we were really demonstrating um, best practices and not such great practices as we facilitate our abortion healing groups. And some of you had some really distinct reactions to uh, the way in which we were role playing. Uh, Greg and Heidi joined me and we had some interesting dialogue uh, that you paid a great tribute to through your questions and comments. And so as a result of some of those comments and questions, we really felt the topic of codependency emerge. We've been doing something different this year, if you've been noticing, is we've kind of had this open-handed approach as it pertains to the webinar, really kind of trying to follow your lead, uh, what it is that you're needing to become the best facilitators, the best understanders of uh, abortion healing. And uh, so we've just really created topics every month that pertain to maybe the, the webinar prior. And so the emerging topic, like I said last month, was this topic of codependency. And uh, as I mentioned before, codependency is near and dear to my heart. I've been in recovery from codependency for about 12 years now, and I had no idea what codependency was when it was first presented to me. Uh, and in the last 12 years, although I've, I've uh, done a lot of growth, I've learned a lot more about myself. And today, uh, admittedly, I'm still growing because healing is a journey and not a destination. And uh, this to me is one of the biggest topics as it pertains to abortion healing. So all the other topics aside, as we think about the human behind uh, the abortion experiences, I believe codependency to be the biggest issue facing men and women. And why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons to that. But as we think about relationships, in order for dysfunctional relationships to exist, we need somebody who makes a mess and somebody who cleans it up. Okay, I want to say that again. In order for any dysfunctional relationship to exist, we need somebody who makes a mess and somebody who cleans it up. How does that look in relationship? You can't have two people making messes and that relationship lasts for any length of time right? They're going to not pay the bills. They're going to cause a lot of chaos. There's going to be tons of legal issues. There's going to be too much pressure and stress for that relationship to last for a very long time. If you have two people that like to clean things up and they're both very clean and they like messes to clean up and they don't have a mess to clean up, they're going to find themselves uh, lacking purpose, lacking value, lacking identity in relationships. So here again, in lies that need for somebody to make messes and somebody to clean them up. And so that to me is the best way to describe codependency. I'm going to describe it different ways, but I really was attracted to that uh, clarity at the very beginning of my journey, because what I quickly learned was that I was taught from it a very early age okay. that Cleaning up messes yeah. meant love, <laughs> meant value, <laughs> meant respect. Somebody's <laughs> not muted. I'm going to wait just a second. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm going to say that again. I learned from a very early age that love meant helping other people. Love meant fixing other people. Love meant finding people that uh, I could make better. I didn't know that that's what I had thought love was, but that was what was mirrored to me as a child. And so I grew up in this paradigm of feeling love by finding partners that needed help, that would make messes that I could help them clean up. And what I found in this journey is that oftentimes helpers like yourself have a very similar understanding of how to express love. 
And so you may relate to what I'm sharing. Uh, you may see this in the clients that you serve. Uh, and you may also not be really aware of this part of you that's maybe being, you know, touched on today. But there's a reason that you like to help people. And uh, sometimes underneath that is the way in which you feel like you can express your love. And so I don't want you to think that that's a bad thing, but I want you to become more aware and uh, perhaps leave here today feeling a little bit more connected to your own motives and also the motives of your client. So we're going to start, I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, we're going to start with a flyer that we used in one of our presentations recently. And I like this picture uh, as a way of kind of showing what codependency looks like. Okay. And for all intensive purposes, this can be reversed, right? Women are not the only codependents out there. Men are also codependents, but this picture was such an exemplary way for us to show what, it, what codependency looks like uh, that I didn't want to miss it for you. And so as you look at this picture, I want you to notice the body language. I want you to notice what you might think the people in this picture are thinking about themselves. I want you to notice the way in which those strings are attached, right? I want you to notice, are those strings really attached or is it a perception of attachment? And I want you to think of somebody, perhaps yourself, that you can connect this picture to, okay? So for me, I see myself as the woman with the blue shirt on. Uh, at times in my journey, I have had very low self-esteem. I've lacked purpose and understanding of who I was. And so I would connect to people that did not turn towards me. They actually turned away. And I would do everything in my power to try to wrangle them back in. I, I was taught this from a very early age. And uh, these strings were invisible to me. I didn't know that that's what they were, but I was trying to control everything in my journey, including the men that I was in relationship with, including the people that I worked with and all sorts of things in my life, my parenting journey and this sort of thing. There was an unhealthy attachment to needing to be in control. So I want you to just envision either yourself in this photo or perhaps somebody that you love and care about. Maybe this is a client that you're currently serving, right? And I want you to think of how this shows up in unexpected pregnancies. How does this show up inside of our offices? Where does this picture seem familiar, right? Can you envision the woman in the blue shirt being pregnant, facing an abortion experience and having some sort of unspoken tethered connection to her partner, influencing her decision regarding the abortion experience, okay? Or vice versa, the woman being pregnant and the man not knowing his role, being condemned by society and having this un spoken tether to the woman and this abortion experience possibility. Okay. So as we scroll down, I'm going to go through 10 things that I want you to really just grasp with me as we think of signs of codependency. Okay. So I want you to just listen to my voice, if you will. I'm going to read these and I want you to just be really open to maybe possibly envisioning where you see this in your own life, in your client's life, and in the lives of those that you love. Number one, fear rocking the boat or upsetting others. So you may be codependent if you fear rocking the boat or upsetting someone else. You might say, oh, that's normal. We all are afraid of, of hurting other people. Yes, but if this is showing up more than it isn't, I would call that a red flag, okay? Number two, if you have a hard time thinking about your own needs in a relationship, this might be somebody who says, hey, let's go out to dinner. Where do you wanna go? 
And most of the time you say something like, I don't know, wherever you want to go. Or somebody might say, what do you need right now? I don't really know what I need. And if this is your response more times than not, there again is a red flag. Okay. Number three, your days are full of worrying about others. That is a red flag as you consider signs of codependency. Okay. This might mean not that we don't have natural worry about other people, natural worry about things in our life, but this might be an intense fixation on where's my son today and what is he doing? And I hope he's not using today. And I wonder if I should call him. Why didn't he respond to my text message? Um, I wonder if he has enough money to get through the day, right? Or maybe my husband, I wonder if he um, is truly being honest in our marriage and he's doing everything that he said he was going to do. You know, I haven't heard from him and I haven't checked his phone in a while. Or I don't know about that friend. She hasn't called me in three days. We haven't talked in a couple, you know, in a couple, we always used to talk every single day. And now where is she and what is she doing? And we get really fixated on what other people are thinking and we care so intently that it distracts us from our day. Number four, this kind of parallels what I just was saying. We obsess about people being pleased with us. So this oftentimes is the big filter that I want you to be thinking about as we look at codependency, because it questions our motive, right? If I'm buying this gift for somebody because I want them to know that I am good and I want to hear them say that I am good and I want them to feel like I'm their best friend, I would say that your motives are not pure, right? We want to give things to people. We want to do things for people out of the goodness of our heart with no strings attached. But if we are doing things, expecting something in return, that's a very dangerous place to be. And that questions our motives. Five, we can easily lose ourselves in other people's dramas, needs, problems. And this one here is what I see in facilitation all the time. And probably the one that we were so worried about last webinar, right? So worried about our clients that we are willing to do 150% of the work and our client doesn't have to lift or do one single thing. We do not want to ever do more work than other people in our life. We don't ever want to do work that isn't asked of us. We don't want to give advice if it's not being asked. But if you're someone or you know someone that's like this, that somebody comes to you and they're just telling you their problems and you're like, you know what, what you should do? You should do this, right? Oh my gosh, can you believe that? I, you should do this. And we want to be really careful about how we insert ourselves, right? That client who doesn't call you back, you call them, you follow your protocol and you call them six more times because you insistently think that those phone calls are gonna get them to come back. And the reality is you're only pushing them further away, right? At some level, we need to accept that people have their own autonomy and can make their own decisions. And no matter how hard we press, no matter how hard we push into their lives, it's up to them how much they're willing to accept, how much they're willing to do. And for some of you, that is a hard thing to hear, right? Some of you really, really might not agree with me. And, I, and I'm, I'm open to that conversation here in a little bit. All right, moving over to the other side. Number six, we are more comfortable taking care of others than ourselves. I was just on a phone with the just on the phone with a client who said, My mom used to say all the time growing up that when we're hurting, just go serve somebody else. And you know, our culture would say, Yes, do that. That's the best way to do it. And sometimes we misperceive the 12 steps as saying that is what we're supposed to do in our pain. And I am not saying we don't serve other people, but if our motive for serving other people is to not feel our feelings and distract ourselves so we never have to look at our own pain, that's codependency, okay? So if we are more comfortable sitting in other people's stuff 
than sitting with our own stuff. And at the end of the day, if you're like, man, I'm so exhausted. Everybody needed me today. And the reason you're exhausted is because you didn't meet yourself. That is a sign of codependency. Right? We see this as it shows up in abortion experiences that we see women and men choose abortion because they're thinking about their partner. We see them choose abortion because they're thinking about their parents. We see them choose abortion because of fill in the blank. They're not first considering themselves because they've been taught to really focus on everyone else. And so therein lies that root of abortion is that we're so concerned, we're so consumed with what everybody else needs that we don't think about our own needs and we actually self-destruct as a result, right? Number seven, we tend to overshare or overgive emotionally, financially, and physically. And this kind of in line, you know, really intersects with number five, right? We're giving more than we are getting. That's a big sign, right? And some of you might be challenged by your faith in this way. You might be wondering, you know, how does this, how does this connect, right? I would say that there, there is where we filter what our motives are. If you're giving because you have something you're looking for in return, if you're financially supporting someone because you're afraid of what might happen to them, you're uh, emotionally supporting them out of a place of unhealth, that is codependency. Number eight, we struggle setting boundaries and holding people accountable. Man, we see this all the time. And we see this in a lot of places. Uh, we might say, if you don't stop drinking, I'm not going to fill in the blank. And they don't stop drinking. And their words were basically water because they did not follow through with whatever that boundary was. Those ba The boundaries we set with our words are just words then. And we don't have any value behind what we what we really believe and what we want. Um, this is true of those facilitators that say, hey, we are going to talk for 30 seconds. And at 30 seconds, I'm going to give you that timeout like we role play. And you don't stop the client at 30 seconds. That's starting to show a level of codependency in a group environment where you're not going to hold people to the level of accountability that you once said. And when people can't trust our words, they stop trusting the experience. Okay. Number nine, people that struggle with codependency suffer from self-doubt and often doubt your perception, okay? I love demonstrating this, this, uh, this, this attribute, if you will, uh, to a hula hoop. You've heard me talk about this before. Many people that struggle with codependency don't know who they are. And so if you can envision a hula hoop, and you can think of that inside of that hula hoop is our personal space. It's our identity. It's our value. It's our worth. It's everything we were created to be. Early on, codependents are taught to take care of other people. They, they learn to get their value outside of themselves. So they abandon their hula hoop and begin jumping in other people's hula hoops as a way of being validated and affirmed. And so what happens as a result of that is they never grow an alignment with who they really are. And so naturally what happens, you don't trust yourself. You don't know who you are. You look to other people to tell you who you are. And so that's why the intersection of abortion and codependency is so real, because if you aren't walking in alignment with yourself, how do you know what you're capable of? How do you know what you really believe? You're jumping from hula hoop to hula hoop to get everybody else's insight, and you aren't looking to yourself. And so oftentimes there's that disconnect for people in their abortion healing is, you know, I don't know what I wanted. I still don't know what I wanted. Uh, I, I'm confused altogether. And the relationship that I abandoned myself for is not no longer in existence. And I don't know if I'm more angry about that or more angry that I experienced abortion. I don't know. And so getting in touch with who we really are is the first step to this journey. And it's a very difficult step because some of us have been in this journey of codependency for decades. And so how do we get out of that when this is all we know? It's a, it's a hard, it's a stringent healing process.
And the last one speaks to kind of where this all starts. And that's, we're raised by somebody who needs help. They're either an addict, an alcoholic, a narcissist. They don't have the ability to care give. And so a child emerges feeling like they have to be the caregiver. They're awarded for being the caregiver. They're the oldest child who takes care of the three younger siblings because dad's sleeping all day and mom's working two jobs. And every night when mom gets home exhausted, she says, thank you so much for feeding the kids dinner. Thank you for taking care. I don't know what I would do without you right? We, we see this a lot in the clients that we serve, right? That they were, they were reflected back. They were raised in paradigms where they were given, you know, stripes, if you will, for the service that they provided as a young person. We often hear that codependents are raised, you know, to really, they have to grow up really fast and they're raised to be little adults. And, uh, and so they often don't even know what it is to play and have fun and, and uh, see themselves. They, they only can see other people. And so this is just scratching the surface on what codependency is and what we see as it relates to our own personal journey, our families, and those that we serve. And so I'm going to um, stop sharing and I'm going to turn to our Unraveled Roots book and I am going to read the paragraph on page 63 for those of you, or sorry, 61, um, for those of you who are familiar with our book, Unraveled Roots. And then what we are going to do is create a dynamic conversation. We're just putting the toe in the water. We're going to share some experiences that we're going to be offering to you free of charge as a result of this, where you can get more understanding of codependency. But I'm going to read from this chapter as I am. I want you to be thinking about what questions might you have? What group conversations do you want to have? What might you want to say about this topic? Um, and then we'll open it up for conversation. But I'm on page 61. I've been told by some of our clients this is the best um, the best way it's ever been described in terms of codependency. Um, but it's the first, par first paragraph on page 61. It says, when trees are planted too close together... Their roots become intertwined. They compete for resources. The closeness limits their growth potential and threatens their health. They aren't able to produce as many leaves or as much fruit as a tree that has more room to grow. Instead of expanding wide and flourishing, the trees grow tall and skinny, a pale, sickly shadow of what they are designed to be. When we become too closely intertwined with others, depending on them to provide our sense of value and purpose, we can also experience similar damaging effects to our personal growth and development. This is often known as codependency. Wow, like just illuminates, like we are supposed to be these strong rooted oak trees, right? That's how we are able to thrive. But if you think of it like this image here is that when we are too crowded by everybody else's needs, we actually don't get to grow strong within ourselves. We become these skinny little trees that are easy to break. And there is the connection between abortion and codependency, unexpected pregnancy and codependency, uh, alcoholism and codependency, uh, gambling and codependency, porn addiction and codependency, right? The person with all the problems sucks the codependent because they let them and they become these sickly trees that are easy and able to be broken. Okay. So that's just a beginning conversation, like I said, an introduction to better understanding ourselves and our clients. Uh, I am excited about what conversations might be sparked as a result. So I'm going to invite my partner in crime, Kylie, to the scene. And uh, Kylie, would you help us facilitate some dynamic conversation? Yeah, I've been watching the chat, Lisa, and um, I would like for you, Lisa, to take a moment to talk to the person who just identified that codependency is part of their abortion story. Ah, uh, okay. Number one, I want to let you know, I see you. Uh, number two, I want to let you know that this was inevitable. Uh, nobody taught you how to love and value yourself. And you were destined to look to other people for validation, affirmation, 
and uh, decision making. And I am extremely sorry that you didn't get the help that you needed prior to your abortion and that your decision was stolen from you because you didn't know how to hold on to it. And so this is probably happening in other areas of your life too. It was not just your abortion experiences. It was the relationships you were in. It was conversations about money. It was taking care of people when you weren't capable of really caring for those people because you were a child yourself. You were not trained for this experience. And I am so sorry that that is your story, but I will offer you hope today that change is possible. Healing is possible. And there's new and different waiting for you. That was really beautiful. Uh, Deborah Tilden, I'm, I'm going to hopefully call you out <laughs> from the crowd because I think you, uh, you have very generously shared in the chat a little bit about your journey of discovering codependency and your abortion route. Um, Deborah, would you be able to come on live and share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, hey, Deb. Hi. It's just amazing to hear this and how I would have loved to have heard this early on. But as you showed that the 10 points, mm -hmm. it's interesting to look back on my journey and all those places where it's like, check the box where you don't even realize you're doing it and you're living in this space. You know, for me, it was 23 years before we ever talked about our abortion and so there's just a lot of life patterns and self-destructive things that are happening in your life during that time. And you're really just kind of getting by, but I love this, what you're doing because it just helps us identify, you know, there's things that are, um, you know, the picture that you showed of the man and the woman, and it's so multidimensional because mm -hmm. when you think about just the act of creating a child together, there is that from some of the studies that they've known out there that we're finding is that subatomic quantum physics level of connection that is rarely talked about, but there is that physical, physiological connection that takes place that how God designed the universe to operate. So it's really in a lot of ways, such a complex dynamic um that takes place as well as that emotional connection you have with mm -hmm. the man of your child and it's something i'm so grateful for you guys how you go deep into this stuff because society doesn't like to acknowledge it even the psychology field and the psychiatry fields don't really go deep into the very specific nature of abortion trauma and recovery very, very it's kind of ignored as very, so very, i'm so grateful for you guys very, and what you're doing you're just really taking it piece by piece by piece you know and it's so important to not overlook some of these subtleties sometimes that it seems like it's very subtle maybe to us but how it's affecting our life and our choices is very real. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deb. So Lisa, next thing that um, that I've I've been able to watch, I, people are connecting dots, but um, it's a quiet crowd today. Um, I think there's a lot to absorb about uh, what you're sharing, and we have a we have somebody who shared that they were that they are bipolar. And I wonder if you could take a moment to talk about how we look at that list of 10 signs and how many do we need to hit <laughs> of those before we, re we really say like this is codependency versus other expressions of uh, other things that are going on in our lives. I think that you can have a uh, more than one diagnosis. I think you can have more than one reason why things are, why you're experiencing. I think you can have codependency and other mental health issues. 
Uh, I think codependency shows up as a relational conversation with ourselves and with others, where oftentimes mental health issues are more internal between us. They come out in the world through our actions towards others, but codependency is, it requires two people. It requires an interaction with somebody who uh, really needs your help. And, uh, and so we see this in relationships most often. And in terms of how many questions we would ask, you know, I would say that if you have one that hits you, I'd want you to do a deep dive to just better understand why that one area exists in your life. We don't have to call it codependency, but let's just say this is a risk factor for unhealthy behavior in relationships, right? This is, this could be an indicator of low self-esteem. This could be an indicator of looking to somebody else to value value you because you don't value yourself. So, uh, you know, where, where it might be like, I have five of these things and it's really clear I have codependency or I'm not sure I do. I'd want you to just understand yourself in a different way and say, gosh, um, how do I feel about myself? And can I be alone? And uh, if I can't be alone, what's the reason for that? And when I am in relationships, do I feel like an equal partner or do I feel like I'm pulling the weight a lot? Uh, can I make decisions by myself or do I struggle with that? What was my paradigm growing up and what did I see as relationships were modeled to me? Uh, and, and really understanding how did I see conflict resolved? And so there's things in there that really require us to do deep dives within ourselves and see what is our motive. That's the number one indicator. What is our motive? Do we know who we are? And can we really determine who we are without somebody else? It's a really hard thing to ask ourselves. You used uh, the word recovering codependent when you opened our conversation today. And that's something that I relate more to alcoholism, you know, a recovering alcoholic. Can you tell me a little bit more about why you use that terminology when you talk about yourself? Absolutely. Codependents are as sick as alcoholics. They're as sick as gambling addicts. They're as sick as pornography addicts because codependency is an addiction to person, people, places, and things. So where an alcoholic needs alcohol to numb, to uh, avoid, to whatever their experience is, a codependent needs people, places, and things to numb their experiences. And so there's this essence of uh, the codependency that has an addictive connection. And so uh, the 12 step model, there's lots of codependency recovery groups. If this is really hitting you, I would recommend that you go on coda.org, coda.org. Um, Alcoholic Anonymous, uh, sorry, um, Al-Anon, uh, the Partners of Alcoholics. There is so many people running groups out there that are identifying as people that don't know how to set boundaries. They don't know how to disconnect from unhealthy people. They don't know how to set boundaries. And these are all indicators that you are addicted to that chaos. You are addicted to that person. And uh, and so that's where that that terminology comes from, Kylie. That's beautiful. Thank you for explaining that. And um, there's several of you who are being very vulnerable in the chat. I don't want to call you out to speak um, about what you're sharing, but if you do feel so uh, inclined, we'd love to see you raise your hand and, and join this conversation. So I'll let that marinate for a minute while I ask my next question, Lisa, which is, so we, we uncover that we are codependent how do I identify which relationships in my life uh, can be recovered and sustained and made new in a healthy way? And which relationships in my life do I just need to put the ax to? <laughs> that is a great question. And I don't know if you're going to be anticipating what I'm about to say. All relationships can be renewed. All relationships can be rectified as long as you have renewed and rectified the relationship with yourself. Because if we take ourselves everywhere we go and we have a trust in ourselves, we have an alignment in ourselves, we know what we want and what we don't want. We know what our needs are and what we don't need. We know what we're secure with and what we're not. You can enter into any situation and decide how you wanna handle it from there. Um, great picture for you to kind of better understand what I'm saying. Oftentimes, codependents are like those um, 
castles, if you will, go back in the day. And I'm thinking Rapunzel because of my kids. And I'm thinking of, you know, the water around the castle. And I'm thinking of that old drawbridge that goes over the waterway and lets people in to the castle. Well, if you, if you see the codependent as the castle, right, having this big protection around their castle and this control over the drawbridge, we have that control as the castle. Unfortunately, many of us have left the drawbridge down for too long or have shut it and made this all or nothing decision in relationships. And so the idea here is that you would understand that you have control of that drawbridge and it doesn't have to be all or nothing. There's gray that lives inside of our relationships, but unfortunately with codependency and most other trauma, we see the world as all or nothing. The house is either on fire or it's safe. Mom is either um, really healthy or she's sick in bed. You know, dad is drunk or he's uh, and hitting everybody or he's sober and, you know, joking and, and being fun, right? We don't know how to live in a place often as codependents in this middle space. So that would be the first step, Kylie, as you're asking that question, is that we have to connect with ourselves. We have to create that relationship with ourselves first. And then it is, we can decide what relationships. And you may say, there's relationships in my life that are not healthy for me to be around. I don't want to go to the bar anymore, or I don't want to go to this friend's house. I don't want to, but you, you don't have to, but maybe it's safe to talk with them on the phone. Uh, maybe it's safe to uh, once in a while connect with them over dinner. You can decide that. Um, but I want you to leave with this specific question in mind is that you are the primary source. You are healing yourself. And then from there, you can make wise decisions. Well, you're right. You did surprise me with your answer. So <laughs> we have Patty Hunter, uh, who has uh, figured out how to raise her hand. I'm so proud of you, Patty. Thank you. Um, if you would like to come on um, camera and share, uh, we would welcome that right now. Well, my... Uh camera doesn't work, but I'm still here. <laughs> um, We're glad you're here. I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana, originally from Toronto. My late aunt was an abortionist, and her assistant uh, killed my sister, my twin sister's child. And she's very codependent on her son, her second son. And she won't you won't let him go, you might say. She's completely emotionally or whatever dependent on him. And he doesn't have a girlfriend or anything like that. She's, uh, she needs healing. It's, this was 50 years ago when she had the abortion. We're here at 70. And how, how, how can I reach out and mm. help her? You. Well, she's great question, Patty. So if I understand your question is that you're watching someone you love and care about struggle in yeah. a codependent relationship with her son, and you're wondering how you can help her. I'm wondering how I can help them both. I'm not sure <clears throat> if her second child is aware of her having an abortion in the first place. Hmm. And okay. I named, she's my twin. I feel what she feels. I named her first child Grace because for some reason I felt I had to, but the Holy Spirit to help me because I was deeply saddened from what she had done. Okay. My first question, Patty, is does your sister want help? She won't. She said she put that behind her, back in her head. She doesn't want to face it. I tried gently talking with her about this, and she uh, hung up and has not didn't speak to me for almost a month. Then we start to start to thaw out, as you might say, being cold with me. So she's very, very uh, hurting. Mm hmm. So what her behavior is telling me is that she's not interested in what you have to say in this space. 
It doesn't sound like she's ready to change or see anything different. Mm -hmm. And so Patty, the best thing you can do for her is love her where she is Mm -hmm. and respect your boundaries as it pertains to the relationship that you have with her. And sometimes when we meet people where they are and they grow safer with us and they're ready, they may ask for our support. She's in Canada. I'm down here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Mm -hmm. So I can't be near her. So it's kind of tough on me as well as more on her, you know. Right. So I don't know. Like you say, pray. Leave the door open for her or be there when she needs you. Me, that is, and help. Yes. And that's all. Yes. And acknowledging that when you did try to force your, you know, interests into that conversation, she told you through her behavior that it was too much for her. Yeah. So uh, I got to stop. I'll just pray. Good job, Patty. And leave the bridge down if it feels safe to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good job. Thank you, Patty. It affected the whole family. Mom and dad never knew. They told me not to say anything to them that what Jerry, my twin, had done. I was threatened by my own younger sister about that. Don't tell mom and dad or us. Mm -hmm. So I've been put into a box. Yeah, and I'm proud of you for stepping outside of that box and choosing your own healing journey. And with do things for life and we are helping mothers uh, make an awareness. You know what Lutheran's for life is? I do. Okay, I'm with them as the media. <clears throat> I do TV shows on for life as well. Mm-hmm. Sharing to the world what it is and what is evil and how you know, have people who talk, who are uh, heads of Fort Wayne's uh, pro-life organization been around the world. I have them speak. I ask them questions and I have them speak. Father Frank Bavon, uh Dr. Alvita King, and others around the world. And Patty, you're emulating the serenity prayer, which goes, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Good job. Thank you for sharing, Patty. I love you guys. Thank Thank you. All right, uh, Georgia, uh, would you like to come uh, off of mute and share, please? Hello, everyone. I um, had the privilege of doing the Unraveled Roots with um, Barbara and Greg, and it was it was extremely eye eye opening for me. Um, I didn't realize that I had a codependency problem, but it explained a lot going back from childhood all the way through my adolescence, young adult um, years. Some of the choices that I made, most of which were self-destructive choices um, stemmed from certain aspects of codependency that I had, which I never, I wasn't aware of it. I didn't even know there was such a thing, but it helped me get to the point where I'm able to identify when my borders and my, um, my borders are coming down, especially when I'm working with a client, when when I stop and ask myself, well, okay, you know, is this an actual need or is it me needing to help? Mm-hmm. And depending on what my answer to, to that question is going to allow me to step back and determine, well, okay, if this is not going to benefit my client, then I need to figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. So it was it was very helpful. And it's not something that I guess we might be readily aware of, but it is there. 
it is there and it does interfere with us um, being able to effectively serve our clients. Mm, thank thank you. you. Yes. Thank you for doing the work. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for the vulnerability that you're demonstrating and the humility and sharing this about yourself. Um, Lisa, before we go to the next question, I think there's something important that, that we should cover. And that is at Support After Abortion, we care so much about our language. Can you tell me a little bit about person first language when it comes to codependency? Sure. Uh, you know, in the 12 step program, oftentimes there's this need to identify as a, as an addict, right? Because what the belief system is in the 12 step program is that we are powerless over that thing. And in order to start a healing journey, we need to admit that that thing has more power over us. We can't overcome it without the help of a higher power. And so oftentimes you hear people say, I'm an alcoholic rather than saying I'm struggling with alcohol. It's I'm an alcoholic as a way of saying, I don't have power over this thing. Wherever you land on that spectrum, uh, what Kylie's asking is sometimes people are more comfortable saying, I am a woman that struggles with codependency rather than saying I am a codependent. And so there's multiple ways to say that depending on your recovery and your belief system. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't want to be acknowledged as somebody who is this. Um, you know, I am a woman who struggles with uh, domestic violence, or I'm overcoming domestic violence, rather than saying I'm a domestic violence survivor, all different ways to say that we often talk about that with abortion experiences, rather than saying I'm a post abortive woman, many people and we encourage this language would like to be spoken to as I'm a man or woman who's experienced abortion. So uh, there's a little bit of uh, navigation there, depending on what you're comfortable with and how you see uh, your recovery. And, uh, and so perhaps people are negotiating that I'm imagining in the chat, Kylie. Yes. Um, there yeah. is negotiation about this because either in our lives or through this conversation, we're becoming more aware of codependency and traits that are uh, attributed to codependency and that may lead to a conversation. And how mm -hmm. do we enter that conversation in a very respectful and dignified way is going to be impacted by our language um, and not um, being accusatory, but rather uh, opening up the hearts and minds of the people in our lives who we want to see do better and be better. Um, we have a question uh, from the audience of how is codependency different from borderline personality disorder? So I leave that to the clinician to explain to us. <laughs> Uh, borderline personality disorder is awfully, uh, is an awfully big diagnosis that there's too much here, too much time. I don't want to get too far off into it. Again, codependency is a behavior in relationships. It's a need to be connected to people that need us. It's, uh, it's an attribute of our uh, self-esteem and our value where borderline personality disorder is often a, uh, a part of us that develops out of severe trauma. And it's a protective thing where uh, we kind of build this wall uh, around our heart and we don't let anybody penetrate that. We're never wrong. Everybody always is uh, the, the problem. We're never, we're always a victim. And so it's, it's a very different type of way of showing up, but I can see why somebody would ask that question because I imagine in our social media and these sort of things, these things are tossed around a lot. Um, I don't think borderline personality disorders manage relationships well. And so it's not likely that you have somebody with uh, BPD in a relationship. Uh, they can't withstand relationships. And so uh, perhaps that might be an indicator for me as a clinician. Great. Uh, so what do we do next? You've, you've made us aware um, and what should we do next uh, as a good uh, next step to learn more? This is great. Uh, great question. And Ivy's going to share our screen um, shot of all the things that are available for us next. 
Uh, so we know that this is an hour of your day. We know that some of you for the very first time are acknowledging this or Georgia, like she read the book and it was like, I didn't even know this thing existed. And so if that's you, or if you're just really contemplating what else this could mean for you and the practices that you're in, uh, your relationships, we have several options for you. And remember, we always share that you can't sit with somebody else's junk until you've sat with your own. And so we are really helping you develop that space for yourself to get the healing you need and better understanding. So next week, October 25th, I am going to do a much deeper dive into what codependency is. We're going to talk about attachment. We're going to talk about early childhood trauma. We're going to talk about lived experience. We're really going to talk about how codependency intersects at a much deeper level for 90 minutes. We'll have some open dialogue as well. So you can come with your questions there. We also have two other options. There's a deep dive uh, group that Heidi's going to be leading starting on the 8th of November. The information's on the screen. Actually, we have three. Sue, I love Sue. She's going to be leading her Hearts Restored group. She has her information there. She's going to be doing uh, my favorite book, Conquering Codependency. It's an amazing workbook. I've done it four times. It's very, very valuable. And then Karen and Greg are going to be leading a group uh, at the beginning of the year. Oh, both of these groups uh, are going to be at the beginning of the year and uh, she's going to be, they're going to be leading it together. So that could be a really great co-ed opportunity. Uh, you can do one, you can do both. You can do the way steep and then wait until the group starts, whatever that might look like. Uh, but you have the information on your screen. I'm sure it's going to go out in an email where you can uh, learn more and sign up. What time is the 25th? Uh, Ivy, remind me, does it start at 1130? I think it starts at 1130. Um, the link is going to be in the chat feature. I believe it's there. It's Ivy shared it with you. If you click on that link, the information will be there and it'll give you the opportunity to uh, register. Yes, you're right, Lisa. It's 1130 Eastern time uh, on October the 25th. We invite you to this 90 minute waist deep. We, uh, Lisa and I had this brainstorming session. We're like, we're going to go, you know, dip our toe in the water today at this webinar. Then we're going to go waist deep in the water. And then we're going to take this deep plunge and, uh, and really just explore, um, healthy behaviors, um, and learn more. So, uh, Kathy, I got the same error that you did. Um, the link's not working. Ivy, if you could try reposting, uh, the link that that would be super helpful. Um, you can stop sharing your screen right now. Uh, Ivy and, uh, and Lisa, I wanted to ask you one final question that I just, it's a burning question. Um, what would you do first? What would you do first today? If you identified that, that today, you know, you are experiencing symptoms of, of codependency in your relationships and you want to do better. Well, I wouldn't go changing the world today. I'd sit with the feelings that you have. I would possibly journal what you're experiencing. If you have a healthy friend that you can connect with today to just express what you've learned, I would do that. And then I'd take a leap and that might be into that 90 minute deep dive. Uh, perhaps you're interested in going further into one of those groups. That would be a great next step. Uh, like you heard from one of our participants, Unraveled Roots book is a great first step as well. What I don't want you to do is take this meeting, go, wow, something really stuck with me, um, but it's scaring me and I'm going to turn it away. You know, you heard Deb share I, 23 years that she didn't touch this topic um, as it intersected with her abortion experience in a relationship. And it, to my knowledge, Deb is living in a very free relationship today and a healthy relationship with her husband because of all the work that they've done. And uh, let's not wait 23 more years. Let's get on this today. You're not here by accident. Um, but also remembering that it's a journey you didn't get here overnight. And so, uh, you know, some people like to just, okay, I'm ready to go change every relationship and make all, I want you to take a pause in that space and, and, uh, create the network of support and, and walk slowly into this. We have a fantastic, uh, screenshot being shared, um, not my job and my job and a, uh, uh, one of our attendees has shared that not her job is fixing and saving people, being liked, doing it all, pleasing everyone and holding it all together. And her job is to love people, be authentic, take the next step, speak truth and breathe. I like it. Love yourself. That is your job. <laughs> Good job. Thank you, Laura. 
Mm -hmm. And if you have uh, just one more moment with us, Lisa, um, our team was really intentional about setting uh, today's webinar in October prior to entering into Thanksgiving and the Christmas season, uh, because we we know that sometimes there are particular family members that bring out poor behaviors in us. Um, can you speak a little bit about how to be uh, more cautious uh, over the holidays? and stay oh. to your health? <laughs> That's a loaded question, Kylie. Uh, goodness, um, it is very uh, time sensitive, right? Because Thanksgiving's a month from now and then following that month is, uh, is Christmas. And some of you find yourself getting hijacked during these times, who's gonna do this dinner? I always do this thing. Um, uncle, whatever, always gets drunk. I don't wanna be there. And I uh, I would say it's, it's a fully packed question to say I have all the answers, but um, if you don't know what your hula hoop looks like and you don't know what alignment with yourself looks like, it is time to get to know what that looks like and if you do that now, by four weeks from now, you'll have a pretty good idea of what you want for that Thanksgiving dinner and what you want for that Christmas holiday. And uh, and 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 finding that hula hoop through that process is going to be hugely important and a great next step for you. All right, Lisa. Well, thank you so much for today. I I, I agree with the commenter who said this was like therapy. This was like therapy today. So uh, thank you so much for bringing your uh, clinical heart and your own uh, vulnerability of your own experiences to our webinar today, Lisa. We really appreciate you. Absolutely. And this is just a toe, di toe dip. We are going to have some more fun next week. So I hope you can join me then. See you guys later.